Hello, Matthew Bell with InsurancePrescription.com, and today I wanted to talk about emergency funds. So life, as we know, is unpredictable, and having an emergency fund can be a good way to guard against having to deplete other vital assets like your retirement account. Basically, an emergency fund is defined as a sum of money that you would set aside in order to cover surprise expenses. You can think of an emergency fund in a sense as being self-insurance against these kinds of emergencies or surprise expenses, and there's any number of these that might occur, but I'll just name 12 to give you an example. Appliance replacement. Your stove goes out, refrigerator goes out, dishwasher goes on the blink. Number two, car repair. This can range from a few dollars for a lamp that goes out on your headlight to thousands of dollars for some kind of transmission problem. Number three, a child injury or child emergency. Maybe the child falls on the playground, some kind of an illness. For a dental emergency. You might need a root canal. You might need some kind of emergency wisdom tooth extraction to deal with an abscess. Number five, some other disability that you experience, perhaps as a breadwinner. Number six, a funeral expense. Now, hopefully you have adequate life insurance coverage at least somewhere, so you don't have to dip into an emergency fund for this, but it certainly can be an emergency for many people. The only other option here would be to set up some kind of a crowdfunding page like a GoFundMe page. Number seven, home repair. Could be a roof that is in need of being changed, siding, a driveway that cracks, a window that gets broke, a furnace or air conditioning unit that goes out. Number eight, a big one, job loss, unemployment, whether it's temporary or over a longer period of time. Number nine, unexpected health care costs, illnesses, and things along the lines of that. It could be something that is short-lived, or could be something more severe like a cancer or some other kind of a health condition. Number 10 would be pet-related expenses. So pets can have some of the same problems as humans can in terms of illness, injury, and the like of that. Number 11 would be a tax bill, maybe one that you didn't anticipate. You went through a debt settlement and didn't realize that the settled debt is going to be counted on your regular income, or maybe you have recently let life insurance policy lapse and you receive a 1099 for interest charge. And number 12 would be unexpected travel. And this can be in relation to a job. It could be in relation to family affairs, a funeral, any number of reasons. Some expenses along these lines are going to be predictable. You know, if you know that your stove is 10 years old, your refrigerator is 15 years old, and you can see that it's not cooling things the way that it did before, it's probably a good idea to try and get ahead of that and save directly for replacing the refrigerator. Others are completely unexpected, and I probably don't have to give most of my audience any kind of examples there. I'm sure you can think of dozens of cases that have happened to you and people that you know. So how much should you have in a good emergency fund? Well, many experts think of this as being three to six months of income. Other people will say you can stand to have more, six to 12 months of income. But three to six months is probably a good figure to at least start off with. Now, other people reckon it in terms of expenses. So rather than thinking of three to six months of income, some people think of it as three to six months of expenses. And the difference there would be you might use your income for purposes beyond your expenses. You're saving for retirement. Maybe you're having entertainment and vacation savings and things along the lines of that. So some people would say, you know what? You can actually simply make your emergency fund a multiple of your necessary non-negotiable expenses like your mortgage, your utilities, and your groceries. But your actual amount is going to vary. It's going to depend on how many streams of income you have. If you have multiple sources of income yourself or if you have a family that has multiple breadwinners, maybe you and your spouse both work, it might not be as necessary to build your emergency fund up as much if you have multiple sources of income to fall back on. And the basic reason is straightforward. It is less likely that multiple sources of income will all be affected at once. I, however, sat with a couple that both of them worked for the same company. And so a layoff literally affected both of them at the exact same time. There's a difference between predictable and unpredictable expenses. If you think that something like that is a possibility, or if your incomes are closely tied to one another in terms of your occupation and a downturn in whatever industry would affect both of them, then obviously you're going to want to spend a little bit more time and energy building your emergency fund. Another consideration is whether your income is volatile. So if you tend to have wide swings in your paycheck, maybe you work on commission or you get bonuses or work on tips, and what you get 
in terms of one week to the next or one month to the next is likely to vary. You may also want to have some kind of an emergency fund. Maybe you even want to have an additional fund that you don't call an emergency fund. Maybe it's simply a income augmentation account that you have to draw from more periodically in order to give you some kind of consistency. And again, consistency is important in terms of being able to discharge your main obligations as well as to have a good plan for retirement savings that you can stick to and expect to contribute to consistently. Now, what kind of a vehicle is going to be suitable for an emergency fund? Where are you going to want to put this money? Well, one option would be the proverbial mattress, put it in a tin can, bury it in the yard. But obviously here you run into the danger of having it lost, stolen, or, or misplaced. It could be damaged or destroyed in a, in a house fire, for example. Not only that, but you are not going to be earning any kind of rate of return on money if you simply keep it in a container around your house. When you put it into some kind of an institution, there are risks that are associated. There are institutional risks. Banks can fail. Savings and loans can fail. There are risks in putting it into stock market and other vehicles. But for an emergency fund, one of the main concerns is you're going to want it to be liquid. You're going to want it to be accessible. You're going to want to be able to get to it when you need it. But at the same time, as an emergency fund, you don't want to be tempted to use it for purposes that aren't real emergencies. So one thing is you're going to want to have a very realistic definition of what constitutes an emergency. And you're going to want to stick to it. Make your definition of an emergency one that is meaningful. So if an emergency means to you that you're out of pizza or that you don't have a brand new car, your emergency fund probably won't last very long. So it's going to be accessible but not overly so. You might want to consider an online account as opposed to a physical account. You might want to consider not having any kind of a debit card or a checkbook associated with the account so that it's less easy for you to draw money from it. If you need it to be liquid, then we're probably saying that you shouldn't count on the equity in your house or the cash value in your life insurance because although these might be semi-liquid in the sense that they are accessible in principle, they're not necessarily accessible in the time frame that you might need to get to them in a bona fide emergency. In addition, you're going to want your emergency vehicle to be one where you're not going to be assessed taxes, fees, penalties for withdrawal or surrender or anything along the lines of those. So for instance, you're not going to want to make your retirement account pull double duty as an emergency account since your 401k, your IRA, your annuity are number one, most likely susceptible to the 59 and a half rule and secondarily because of that are going to be open to things like penalties for early withdrawal or for non-emergency situations and not every emergency situation that qualifies you for a tax-free or penalty-free withdrawal, early withdrawal, is necessarily going to be the kind of emergency that you will yourself experience. So if you experience a job loss, you can probably access the money in your 401k. But if your pet needs emergency surgery, probably not going to be able to get access to your retirement funds without a penalty. You're also going to want a, ideally, you're going to want your emergency fund to be one where you have access to the funds without being assessed any kind of interest charge. So you're going to want to try, if you can, to avoid using charge cards, credit cards, other kinds of personal loan or consumer debt vehicles as emergency funds. This probably is going to leave you with the option of using some kind of a savings account, money market, possibly a checking account. You should be aware that there are different limits in terms of the number of transactions that can be performed on some of these accounts. In certain circumstances, automatic transactions, for example, are limited to six in terms of savings accounts and money markets because they are classified as non-transactional versus a checking account that has unlimited transactions. But again, if you're using this for an emergency, then you want to have it accessible, but not overly accessible, not a temptation, especially if you are not disciplined. And you have to be honest with yourself about that. If you can, while you have your money in the emergency account, it would be nice to have the best rate of return or interest rate that you could get but in terms of an emergency fund, I think you're going to want to prioritize the accessibility over the rate of return. 
which means that you might end up in a savings account that's earning a little bit less than it would earn in another vehicle, but the purpose of this money is not the rate of return. The purpose of it is to have it available, have it liquid in the event that you need to spend cash very quickly in order to get yourself out of a jam. How can you actually meaningfully begin to save? And I'll give you six different tips. The first tip is you want to be consistent. You want to make sure that you set up a contribution schedule that you actually keep to. You want to put money into this on a regular basis. The amount that you contribute, you want to be meaningful, but you also want it to be sustainable. And what I mean by that is if you're bringing in $100,000 a year, then putting in a dollar a paycheck into your savings account is not going to be meaningful. But at the same time, if you're making $100,000 a year, putting $50,000 into your savings account is probably not sustainable. Probably not also necessary either if you're going to only want three to six months of income. If you're making $100,000, you're making about $8,000 plus a month. So over three months, you're making $24,000, $25,000. Over the course of six months, you'd be making about fifty. dollars So if you were able to contribute $50,000, then you would basically have set up your emergency account in full. But the picture that I'm painting is there will be some contribution level that's so low that you can easily meet it, but it's not actually helping you to save for an emergency and a savings level that is so high that you can't possibly hope to contribute to that savings vehicle in any sort of disciplined manner because it's just too much. You can't afford your other expenses, for example. Now, number two, you can also remember that in any situation where you are the recipient of a block of cash, and this could be any number of different scenarios, you can use that cash to kind of jumpstart your emergency fund or to give it a shot in the arm. This could be work bonuses, this could be raises, this could be inheritances, death proceeds after the passing of relative, lottery winning, something along the lines of that. If you are the recipient of that kind of money, might be a good idea to simply put it aside rather than to blow it on something that you don't need. Relatedly, number three, you can use your tax refund. Now, I put this in a separate category because the tax refund for some people is a predictable part of their financial experience. Now, for some people, they count on this. I would say if you're counting on your tax refund just to get by, you might want to try to prioritize or reprioritize some of your expense and income ratios, some of your spending habits and the like of that, possibly your deductions in terms of some of your tax paperwork, and you want to consult with a tax preparer on that. I am not a tax preparer. This is not tax advice, savings advice, retirement advice. This is simply for general informational or entertainment purposes, and I am not intending any of this information to be construed as specific advice, if you need personalized recommendations, consult a licensed professional in your area. Number four, save separately for different purposes. So let your emergency fund be an emergency fund. If you're going to save for a particular purchase, do that separately. If you're going to save for your retirement, which you should, do that separately. If you're going to save for a vacation, for example, make that a separate fund altogether. If you're commingling, it's very easy to get into bad habits and to spend down your emergency fund on some kind of a purchase that then your emergency fund is no longer there in the case that you actually need it. Don't expect or try to get these various vehicles to pull double duty in that regard. Number five, if you can, set up automatic payments. Similarly to the way you might contribute to your 401k through some kind of an elective deferral or a salary reduction, you might want to just try to automate the process of putting a little bit of money aside, again, meaningfully and sustainably, into an emergency fund. That way it's somewhat out of sight, out of mind. It's just a, an automatic part of what you do every time you're paid. A portion of your money just goes into a separate account. And finally, number six, think of it as a bill if you need to. That is to say, it's non-negotiable. You really need to have an emergency fund set up. And if you do not have one, you need to prioritize it over other expenses, possibly over things like Netflix, over Starbucks coffee, and the like of that. Having an emergency fund can mean the difference between having to go into high interest debt, having to move, get evicted, having to turn to relatives or avail yourself of other perhaps unwelcome avenues in order to get yourself out of a tight predicament if one arises. In addition to that, if you have been making progress trying to pay off debts, keep on top of bills, an emergency can undermine your ability to get ahead. Having an emergency fund can be a kind of a stopgap to help to ensure 
that you can continue to pay down debts and to do other things that are going to help to secure your financial future even in the event of an emergency. But lastly, even when you have an emergency fund set up, and even if you actually are able to fund it with three to six to nine to a year's worth of your salary, still, if an emergency arises, it's a good practice to try to get through the emergency without touching the emergency fund. And the reason for this is having the emergency fund can give you the peace of mind to know that you can dip into it if you need to. But if you are able to discharge an obligation in some other way without going into debt or without putting yourself into a precarious situation, then you should avail yourself of those opportunities or those options and you're going to thank yourself for it because then the emergency fund will be preserved for longer and for different purposes. It's hard. A lot of this is going to depend on discipline, but I hope that something that I said was of interest or of help to you. If it was, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I thank you so much for being with me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Thank you so much.